right, let's take our Bibles and open them to the book of Nehemiah, chapter 1. Nehemiah, chapter 1. And let's see. Let's, uh, let's read verses 1 through 3. Yeah? Begin in verse 1 and join me in reading verse 2 out loud. And then I'll read verse 3. I'll pray and let you be seated. And I'm going to read several other verses after that, so don't lose your, your place there in the Bible. Uh, the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hekeliah. And it came to pass in the month Chisleu, in the twentieth year, as I was in Shushan, the palace, that Hanani, one of my brethren, came, he and certain men of Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left of the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said unto me, The remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. And let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. God, thank you for giving us a place where we can come together and hear from you. And so, God, we ask tonight that that, that would happen, uh, that we would hear from you, that your Holy Spirit would speak to us and help us and strengthen us and provide our needs. God, there's no way I can address every need, uh, for I don't even know them. And even if I did know them, I, I, I still couldn't, uh, couldn't address them. But you and your word can. And so I pray that you would do just that, that we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's continue on here, verse 4. And it came to pass, when I heard these words, that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven, and said, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. Let thine ear now be attentive, and thine eyes open, that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant which I pray before thee now, day and night, for the children of Israel, thy servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against thee. Both I and my father's house have sinned. We have dealt very corruptly against thee, and have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the judgments, which thou commandest thy servant Moses. Remember, I beseech thee the word that thou commandest thy servant Moses, saying, If he transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. But if you turn unto me and keep my commandments and do them, though there were of you cast out unto the uttermost part of the heaven, yet will I gather thee from thence and will bring them unto the place that I have chosen to set my name there. And now these are thy servants and thy people whom thou hast redeemed by thy great power and by thy strong hand. O Lord, I beseech thee, let now thine ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant and to the prayer of thy servants who desire to fear thy name and prosper, I pray thee, thy servant this day and grant him mercy in the sight of this man for I was the king's cupbearer. So keep in mind, Nehemiah uh, is a Jewish person. He's in a foreign land. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar came and captured the Israelites and took them away captive. There was more than one wave that went into captivity. Uh, and God had different men for different groups of people. There was uh, somebody left behind in Israel uh, for those that, the remnant, they had a, a man of God, they had a preacher for them. Uh, the, the ruling class had a preacher and had representatives in Daniel. And then Nehemiah would have been uh, the working class that was taken away captive. He was a servant unto the king and he was the king's cupbearer. And, and so uh, it was his job to provide the king something to drink. And it was his job to make sure um, there was no poison in it. And the way you made sure there's no poison in it is you take a drink of it. If you live, then the king gets to, <laughs> gets to drink also. And so I don't know if he drank from the same cup the, the king drank from. I imagine he probably poured a little bit into another vessel, tried that. And the king watched, and if he didn't kill over dead, then, then he got something. But it was his job to bring something to drink to the king. And I want you to notice verse 3 here. He, he um, 
Hanani shows up from Jerusalem uh, and, and some other men from of Judah. And they he, he asks them, he says, how are things back home? Basically, is what he said, what's... Uh, how are things, what are, how's it going in Jerusalem there? And in verse 3, they said unto me, the remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction. <coughs> and he goes on to say, and reproach. I looked up that word reproach in the dictionary, and there's several, there was quite a bit that was said about it. I didn't write, didn't copy it all down, but I did copy a little bit. And here's, Here's a part of what it means. It means shame, infamy, disgrace. And so he says, here's, the, here's how it is. But he said, it's not good. Things are not going well in Jerusalem. Our people there are living in shame. Our people back home, our family, I mean, these are the, our countrymen, they're living in infamy. Our people there are uh, living in great affliction. And it's, a, it's just disgraceful, the conditions and the way things are going back home in Jerusalem. And he said that it's just the wall of Jerusalem has been broken down. The gates to the city, our beautiful city Jerusalem, have been burned with fire. And look at his reaction in verse 4. It came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted. And pray before the God of heaven. Hey, would to God that we would have some people that would take account of the condition of our country and mourn over the condition of our country. The things that are going on in our country are truly shameful. Our country right now lives in infamy. I don't believe there's any world leader anywhere on the planet that takes our country seriously right now. Clearly, they have no respect. There's no fear of any repercussion. The, the, the worst thing that our country is doing right now, or the, the harshest thing that it's doing right now uh, towards anybody else is saying, don't you dare do that, or we'll tell you, we'll, we'll speak to you very sternly. And, and we'll tell you, shame on you for doing that. And we, we, none of us are very happy with you doing that. Now, let us give you billions of dollars and buy oil from you. Not that we need to buy oil from you. We've got plenty of our own, but we would rather give our taxpayers money to you to buy that oil from you. And, and uh, I, I saw those things, buy American, and, and I thought, well, you know, it's going to be hard to do that because most of the gas stations are getting their gasoline from oil that comes from a company that deals with getting oil from Russia right now. But the leadership of our country, and, and just the, the, the situation, the condition of our country is a condition of reproach. The condition of our country is fast moving towards a condition of affliction. Let me say this, and let me, let me just recommend this, and whether you choose to do it or not, uh, that's on you, but I would certainly uh, recommend stocking up on some food items. You know, when you go to the court, uh, to the store, if you normally get two cans of green beans, buy three. And not so that you don't have to go as soon, but when you get home, set that extra one aside. If you get three cans of corn, you get four. If you get five cans of, of peas, get six. You know, just get one or two or three extra as you can. If you find them on sale and, and uh, hey, that's a great deal, Buy some extra. Set that aside. Uh, one of the things we're doing is, is we're, we're trying to stock up a little bit. Hey, how quickly did we run out of toilet paper two years ago? It was just, boom, instantly, it's gone. Not to be found on the shelves. And, and uh, uh, so a lot of people have stocked up on toilet paper. You know, if it really got real, super bad, you might be able to survive without toilet paper. I mean, at some point, people did. Uh, a long time ago, but nobody has ever learned how to survive without food. And and uh, you don't have to walk very far in the grocery stores to see where they've rearranged some things to make it look like the shelves are not empty. But truly, if they had things arranged the way they did before, you'd find a lot of empty slots. In fact, 
we, we went in recently to a store and it said uh, they had a sign up acknowledging, we're sorry, we are out of this. And it said, we don't know when we're getting it in again. This is where it would be if we had it, but we're all out of it. And, and so it's a, a affliction. It could very well come to our country very quickly. And, and certainly it is currently in reproach. And we need, to, we need to have a mind for that and a heart for it to go to God and spend some time and mourn over the condition of our country. When there's people in power that are saying, you know, we, we, we're, just, we're angry because states are, are making it harder to vote. Not one single state has made it harder to vote. They've made it harder to cheat at voting. They haven't made it harder to vote. They've expanded opportunities and, and ways to vote. They've just made it harder to cheat. And when they say, well, they're trying to damage women's health care. Women's health care does not have anything to do with the murdering of babies. And, and so when, when we're saying, hey, let's take care of babies that are innocent and have never hurt anybody, never done anything to anybody, and, and why should they pay the price for other people's mistakes and and, and uh, hey, our country is in a shameful situation. It, it is in a current state of infamy and disgrace. And God's people need to spend some time mourning over the condition of our country and going to God and saying, listen, these are the people that are in power right now. And we need you to stop them. Now, I'm not calling for a revolution for people to take up arms. I'm talking about people to... Go to God in prayer and ask God to stop them. Now let's go down to chapter 2, because that's not really the sermon tonight. Chapter 2, verse 1, And it came to pass in the month Nisan, in the twentieth year of Artaxerxes the king, that wine was before him, and I took up the wine and gave it unto the king. Now I had not been before time sad in his presence. Wherefore the king said unto me, why is thy countenance sad, seeing thou art not sick? This is nothing else but sorrow of heart. Then I was very sore afraid. So now he's, the king says, whoa, wait a minute. What's wrong, Nehemiah? You've never, you've never been, you never looked like this before. He said, what I'm, what I'm detecting here in you is a sorrow of heart. And Nehemiah is thinking any number of things could happen. I, I could not only lose my job, but if the king isn't pleased with my work, it's not just losing my job. I could lose my head. And so he says, I was sore afraid and said unto the king, verse 3, let the king live forever. Why should not my countenance be sad when the city, the place of my father's sepulchres, lieth waste, and the gates thereof are consumed with fire? Then the king said unto me, For what dost thou make request? So I prayed to the God of heaven. And I said unto the king, If it please the king, and if thy servant have found favor in thy sight, that thou wouldest send me into Judah, into the city of my father's sepulchres, that I may build it. And the king said unto me, the queen also sitting by him, For how long shall thy journey be? And when wilt thou return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I set him a time. Moreover, I said to the king, If it please the king, let letters be given me to the governors beyond the river, that they may convey me over till I come into Judah. And a letter unto Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the palace, which appertain to the house, and for the wall of the city, and for the house that I shall enter into. And the king granted me according to the good hand of my God upon me. Now, I want you to go back to verse 2, where it says, This is nothing else but sorrow of heart. Now, I want us to go forward to verse 12, and I want you to see there, and it says, And I rose in the night, I and some few men with me, neither told I any man what my God had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem. Neither was there any beast with me save the beast that I rode upon. And so he's he's asked the king, let me go rebuild Jerusalem. Let me rebuild the wall around it. Let me put the gate back in order, build a new gate, put that in place. 
and if I can get letters to basically safe passage showing I have the authority to, to be on this journey, and if I can get letters for the guy that's in charge of your, your lumber, all your wood, that he can cut down some trees and provide lumber for us and, and, and all this. And so the king, the king gives him all these letters and all that authority and everything. And, and, and I want to, here's, here's what I wrote down here. When circumstances put sorrow in your heart, and there's times in, in life where circumstances, things happen beyond our control, and sorrow is put into our heart. And, and what do we do? What, how, do? How can we deal with that? And some people say, I just, want to, I just want to isolate myself. I just want to just tuck myself in a corner somewhere and be left alone, and let me just cry there, and let me just, let me just sorrow there, and let me just mourn and. And, and let me just cry over there. And now, Nehemiah had spent time in mourning. He had spent time in fasting. But it was all in time with prayer before God. And God says, I know what you need. You need to be of service. There, you need some work to do. And, and the work that he had to do really didn't benefit himself because he was going to be going back to Shushan the palace and be the, because the king said, how long are you going to be gone? Because I want you back here. I'm not letting you go forever. You can go and get this settled and get this taken care of. But I want you back here. And, and so what I wrote down here was when circumstances put sorrow in your heart, the solution is to allow God to replace it and put service in your heart. And, and uh, I, I heard one fellow put it this way. He said, if we took all of our problems and hung them on a line, you would take yours and I would take mine. And uh, when we get this, when we come to realization that there are other people that are hurting also. There are other people that are in a bad situation right now. You know, this, this woman, and, and I'm not even going to call her name. She belongs to a group of other women and one guy uh, on the internet called him a coven, and I see no evidence uh, to contradict that. Uh, but her biggest beef with what is going on in the Ukraine right now is it has interfered with her vacation plans. And I, I you know why she has that opinion? Why she thinks this is the worst. The worst thing about everything that's going on over there is I've been wanting to go to Italy for over two years now. been planning a vacation there. And, and then Corona came and we couldn't travel. And so we're, all right, now we're getting past that a little bit and, and getting to where, okay, maybe we can take a vacation over there. And now this war breaks out and we're just never going to get to go to vacation. <laughs> well, as they would say in Texas... Bless your heart. <laughs> you know why she has that opinion? Because she doesn't live in a country, she doesn't live in a city where tanks are rolling in, where bombs are being launched, and they're landing in buildings around you, and family members are dying, where the women and children have been evacuated, and many of them have fled the country by foot, you know, there's another fellow over there who is probably just as famous, and he had to walk an American citizen. He was there making a movie and had to leave and walk to the border to Poland. I didn't hear him saying, the worst thing about all this, I didn't get to finish the movie I was filming. I mean, I, I'm here, I'm trying to make a movie. and, and No, why? Because he was in it. He was in it. And there's a difference. Brother Hiles wrote a poem, and, and uh, I'm not real good at memorizing the poems, but I can tell you the gist of it. And the, the, and the thing is, if I could quote it, it would all rhyme. <laughs> but the gist of it was, he was having a kind of a hard time, kind of a, in a, a period of being discouraged in his life after one of the uh, services. And, and he often spent time after the services 
and people would line up outside of his office and meet with him for counseling. And many times they would just say, this is what my problem is. And he would set an appointment with them to meet with them later on. And sometimes that was the appointment and, and he'd deal with them. And he said, you know, by the time I was done helping them with their burdens, I went to pick mine up that I had set aside when I walked in my office and I set it down there. And, and I helped all these people with their burdens and I looked over at mine to pick it back up again and realized that thing's not as big as I thought it was. Hmm. When circumstances put sorrow in your heart, the solution is to allow God to put service in your heart. And so he arose in verse 12, and I arose in the night I and some few men with me, neither told I any man what my God had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem. Neither was there any beast with me save the beast that I rode upon. I went out by night by the gate of the valley, even before the dragon well into the dung uh, port, and viewed the walls of Jerusalem, which were broken down, and the gates thereof were consumed with fire. Then I went to the gate of the fountain and to the king's pool, there was no place for the beast that was under me to pass. Then went I up in the night by the brook and viewed the wall and turned back and entered by the gate of the valley and so returned. And the rulers knew not whither I went or what I did. Neither had I as yet told it to the Jews, nor to the priests, nor to the nobles, nor to the rulers, nor to the rest that did the work. But he had it in his heart to do a service. He had it in his heart to provide something for somebody else, to help somebody, to restore something. Then we go over to uh, chapter 7 and verse 2. It says, Then I gave my brother Hanani, and Hananiah, the ruler of the palace, charge over Jerusalem, for he was a faithful man and feared God above many. And I said to them, let not the gates of Jerusalem be opened until the sun be hot. And while they stand by, let them shut the doors and bar them and appoint watches of the inhabitants of Jerusalem, everyone in his watch and everyone to be over against the house. But the city was large and great, but the people were few therein, and the houses were not builded. Verse 5, And my God put into my heart to gather together the nobles and the rulers. You say, well, I don't know what I can do. I don't know how I could be a service. I don't know. What... I've got sorrow in my heart, but I don't know what to do. Ask God. Ask God. You know, if you'll go to God, and go to God with that sorrow, and that's exactly what Nehemiah did. He, he wound up with, with uh, and in fact it was so bad, his employer said, there's something wrong here. You're not sick or anything. This is a sorrowness of heart. You have sorrow. You, this is nothing else but sorrow of heart. And, and uh, he said, what's, what's going on, Nehemiah? Nehemiah explained it to him. And, and actually, Nehemiah went to God before he explained it to him and, and prayed to God. And then he tells the king exactly the whole situation. And God has put something in his heart. He said, I didn't tell anybody what God had put in my heart. But what God had put in his heart was, that wall needs rebuilt. I'm not a construction man. I'm a cupbearer. Well, that gate needs to be rebuilt. Well, I don't know anything about carpentry. I'm a cupbearer. I, 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 Nehemiah didn't argue with God. He went to God and said, God, this is my burden. This is something that's going on. My city, Jerusalem. And the people there are in great affliction and reproach. And he let God put something into his heart. And then God opened doors for him. You know, Nehemiah wouldn't have gone to his boss and said, you know, this is a, a I hate to ask for some time off. <laughs> because that's not something a cupbearer did. L let me explain Nehemiah's position. Nehemiah, although he served in the palace, was a slave that worked in a very nice house. Didn't come with the, 
with with time off and vacation time and, and things like that. But he had served the king in such a way that the king said, there's something wrong, and he has always served me so well. This is proof that the heart of the king is truly in God's hand. And God turns it. And that day, God turned the heart of the king and turned the eyes of the king to look over at Nehemiah and notice something is different. Nehemiah's never been down. He's never been in the dumps. He's never been sad. He's never, he's never just had this uh, heaviness about him whenever he's been in my presence. Something. Nehemiah, what's going on? And that's nothing but the, the God of heaven turning the king to Nehemiah and Nehemiah finding grace in the king's sight because of God's hand upon him. And so Nehemiah prays to the God of heaven and then he begins pouring everything out to the king. And the king says, go home and build that wall. Go home and build that gate. And he does. And before construction starts, he, he goes out in the night because God put something in his heart. Hey, listen, when circumstances, when things beyond your control put sorrow in your heart, let God put service in in your heart. Does that make the sorrow go away? Well, pretty soon the wall was rebuilt. Pretty soon there was a gate on it. Does that mean there was no opposition? Oh no. There was quite a bit of opposition. And there's always, whenever you start doing something that God has laid on your heart, mark it down, there's going to be opposition. There's going to be people that stand up against you. There's going to be people that mock. There's going to be people that that show up and, and make fun of you and try to distract you and discourage you from it. But you stay with the service that God has put on your heart. When circumstances put sorrow, go to God. God will say, I'll give you a place for service. And here's something you can do. Here's where you can make a difference. It's interesting. Nehemiah didn't bring a whole group of workers with him. He brought a letter that let them get some lumber. All the workers were already there. <laughs> this wasn't really anything that they couldn't have already been doing. The lumber was needed for the gates, not so much for the walls. Everything they needed for the walls was already there. And they could have written the king and said, hey, our gates are in great disrepair. They've been burnt. Could we have some lumber to rebuild them? Or could we buy some lumber to rebuild them? Can we get some wood? Can we get authority to go cut some trees down? And they could have done that. But God said, Nehemiah, I know what he needs. I know what will help him in this situation. When you go to God in those times, God knows exactly what will help. God knows exactly how to take care of that sorrow in that situation. Start out by going to God. And God will start providing an opportunity. It wasn't something Nehemiah had to seek out. God brought it right, literally, not to his doorstep, but right to him in a conversation with the king himself. He didn't have to bring it up. God brought it to the king's attention. The king brought it up, started talking to him, dealing, interacting with him over it. God will do that for us too. Circumstances full of sorrow. All you have to do is open your Bible and say, God, you did it for Nehemiah. I know you're capable of this. I need help with my sorrow. Let's stand. Every head bowed, every eye closed. God will open a door for service for you. So I don't want service. I just want a magic wand to make it all go away. Yeah, I know. 
that's not what you need. That's not what you need. And nobody knows better what you need than the God that created you. The God that made you. He knows your heart better than you do. He knows the pain better than you do. And He knows the solution for it. Our Heavenly Father, thank You for loving us and for knowing us so well, so intricately. God, thank You for Nehemiah's testimony, for his dedication to do his job well and to do it right with a good attitude. Lord, thank you for recording for us his love for his country and the sorrow that he went through when he saw, when he heard about the bad conditions that existed there. God, I pray you'd give your people Christians all over our country that same heartache for our land. Help us to mourn over the wrong that's been done and being done. God, may it mean enough to us to seek you in a very persistent way, even as Nehemiah did. God, when Circumstances bring sorrow to our hearts. We ask that your Holy Spirit would remind us to come to you first and to allow you to put service into our hearts. Bless this invitation now. Have your way with us. and May, may your work be accomplished and fulfilled here, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. As the piano plays, God speak in your heart. Won't you come? Won't you come? You face that time of of sorrow, circumstances, things beyond your control. There's nothing you can do about it. So it seems God knows what can be done. God knows what needs to be done. whatsoever time we may need it. We ask, Lord, that you take us to our homes in safety. Return us again in safety at the appointed hour. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord bless you.